Today's lecture will be over Chapter 4, Section 3, Objectives. Number 1, define the three categories of government. Number 2, identify the three most important geographic characteristics used to describe a country. Number 3, distinguish between natural and artificial boundaries. And number 4, identify the main types of regional political systems. So the first thing that we look at is we're going to look at politics and geography. Um, when we look at politics and geography, it's a little bit different than your um, political science class, government class, things like that. What we do is that we do it a little bit more broad. So for example, uh, we look at a couple different things here. Is that the first thing is that we're going to look at a state. And a state is an independent political unit um, or a country. What this does is that this occupies specific territory and controls internal and external affairs. So for example, the United States would consider to be a state in our definition. The reason is, is that we've got specific boundaries. We know right where that goes. And we also, um, our country goes ahead and it, it kind of handles things inside of those borders. A nation is different. A nation is going to be a unified group with common culture living in a territory. So for example, if you have the um, Jewish people, if you have got um, the Kurds, all of these people would be considered to be a nation. They're a group of people, common culture, but they live in a territory. They don't live specifically in a country. If they are living in a country, so if you have got a nation of people that have the same culture that are living inside a state, that would be considered to be a nation state. So again, make sure that you know the definition between the two. State is going to go ahead and it's going to be a country, got specific borders, nation, group of people, um, similar culture. If they are a nation state, they are all in kind of the same thing. Now, there are different types of cultures here. There should be different types of government. The first is going to be a democracy, and this is when citizens hold the power. Um, for example, in the United States right now, we do have a democracy. The citizens hold the power. Now, you might sit there and say, well, wait a minute, Mr. Breyer. Uh, the citizens of the United States don't have the power. It's actually the people that are elected. We actually elect those people. We elect the Senate. We elect the House of Representatives. We elect the President based upon the um, Electoral College. College. So we have a democracy. We can go ahead and we can uh, we have the political power. Now, if a political power is going to be held by a single person, specifically a king or a queen, that's going to be a monarchy. A monarchy is when the king or king can go ahead and do what they want to do. There is something that is kind of underneath the monarchy called a constitutional monarchy, where there's a king or queen that can really do what they want to do, but the constitution makes it that they can't do everything that they want. So a little bit different thing. There. The next would be a dictatorship, and this is a group or an individual that holds all political power. Now, what's important to know about this is what the, kind of the definition of all political power. For example, in the United States, if we had a dictator, the dictator would have to be able to control four different things. The first would be um, the three branches, so that would be the um, uh, judicial branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and then the fourth thing that they would have to be able to control would be the military. Um, some uh, countries have had dictators that are able to control most of that, those things, but a dictator really truly has got power um, and it's centralized into one person. Now, communism is different than democracy. Communism is a government and an economic system, so a little bit different than just straight up democracy. Communism is a political and ec economic power where the government basically holds the power. So for example, in a communist country, um, the, they're going to go ahead and they're going to set the prices. And I say they, the, uh, the government is going to set the prices of objects. They're also going to tell people what type of jobs they can have, what they can produce, all those things. So communism would be that system that the government really holds all the power. Now, geographic characteristics of a nation, group of people, size, physical size, and not accurately reflect political or economic power. For example, um, probably one of the most influential countries in all of the world would be um, led by the Pope, and that's, of course, going to be Vatican City. The Pope is going to be the leader of the Catholic um, religion, and so that's a very, very, very small area right there. So they're very influential, but they're very small. 
The shape, shape uh, kind of affects governance, transportation, relations with neighbors. For example, if you look at Chile in South America, Chile has to make sure that they have got a good um, transportation network because it is such an elongated area. But of course, with the water being right next to it, they use that. Um, if you're a country like on the Iberian Peninsula with Spain and Portugal, you're probably going to go ahead and you're probably going to be fighting a long time because you're so close and you're going to be fighting other issues. So shape does also affect the character characteristics of a nation. The other thing is uh, the location of the area. You might have a landlocked country. This is when there's no direct outlets to the sea. Um, this can be problematic for a lot of different reasons. Limits prosperity by shipping and trading basically because you're having to go through a different country and if that country is a kind of a if you have a negative relationship with that you may not be uh, really doing a very good job and you may not be able to trade and, and things like that. So um, hostile neighbors and this uh, kind of you're going to have to increase security and that's going to cause issues as well so the location does affect things you also see nat national nat natural boundaries this is going to be formed by rivers lakes mountain chains um, there are artificial boundaries as well for example you see a fixed line like the 49th degree um, line that separates the United States from Canada that's going to go ahead and that's going to be a defined area but if you drove up there you wouldn't see a specific line however the natural boundaries if you went east from Nebraska you would see a river the Missouri River and that's going to be a natural boundary right there you also see political subdivisions. Um, what we see is countries divided into smaller political units. Uh, the United States, we have our federalism where we have the country of the United States. Then we also have a states. Then we also have counties and cities and things like that. Smaller units can combine regionally into counties, um, states, things like that. But you can also go outside of your borders. For example, you have the United Nations. This is going to be an international organization. And in this international organization of subdivision, they're basically going out there and they're showing that they're going to be connecting and working for the betterment of humanity, or at least that's what they're supposed to be doing. And so what you see is, is that the countries have to do a balancing act between the interests of themselves and the interests of others. That completes our lecture over Chapter 4, Section 3. Please complete your assessments at this time.